Thank you, Laura, and thank you for the introduction. And thank you also for the invitation to speak in this webinar series. I gave uh, one earlier in the spring on metabolomics, uh, which was one of my other research areas. But today I'll be talking about the methylome uh, and which is another, I guess, a synonymous term referring to DNA methylation. So this is an introductory webinar. So I'll, be, I'll just kind of give more of a big overview uh, about platforms and technologies and the data analysis um, issues. So just to, or a few words just to organize through the talk, I'll give a, or more of the biological definitions and introduction on DNA methylation. I'll then start with a motivating example uh, from a, a paper that I uh, helped consult on. And then I'll get into the technologies and you know, the big picture questions when one is starting on a methylomics uh, study and sort of what are the uh, issues to consider. Getting into technologies, both array and sequencing, and then the data processing issues specific for those technologies, and then get into the analyses. And some of these analyses are actually uh, similar regardless if you're using arrays or sequencing. So I'll focus more on the common themes in, in terms of technology analysis. And finally, some uh, public resources to, to kind of conclude uh, the session. So uh, feel free to put uh, questions in the chat or comments. Uh, I think, uh, Rob and Shonik will be monitoring. Um, and then at the end, we'll have a longer stretch to get into more you know, topics and conversation. So great. So first, the introduction. Um, so a DNA methylation is a type of epigenetic effect. Um, epi here refers to uh, above or in addition to the genome. And these are genomic modifications that do not involve a change in the nucleotide sequence, but they do involve changes here. You can see on this figure on the right, hopefully you're seeing my mouse, but here's a histone where the DNA wraps around. So you have modifications to the histone uh, or you have modifications to the nucleotide sequence and um, and the effects of these are they can influence both uh, positive, you know, either upregulate or downregulate gene expression. Okay. So that's why they're interesting to study. Uh, and they're both stable in that they're heritable, but they're also very dynamic. Uh, and then they can occur in response to environmental exposures. Okay. So we have this nice uh, balance, and I'll get into that a little more later. So before I talk about DNA methylation, I thought it was worth to say a few words about uh, histone modifications. Uh, just so you can get a bigger view of, of epigenetics. Uh, as I showed before, these are modifications um, to histone proteins. So here you can see the histones, amino acid sequences, and then there's these little flags for different kinds of modification. So they're very specific uh, where you have, let's say, uh, methylation and arginine-4. And that's, so they're labeled both by the kind of modification and also the position and the amino acid. So there's several, there's, uh, you can see here several dozen, uh, some of the ones that are, you know, more uh, studied than others, like histone acetylation and methylation, but as you can tell, there's a variety of types of modifications. And like DNA methylation, these can influence the activation or repression of gene expression. And you can see that here, uh, very much what, how it relates to DNA accessibility. So uh, depending on these modifications, you can have either more um, active chromatin, where then the DNA is more accessible, it's positively regulates gene expression, or you may have uh, more heterochromatin where everything's wound up much more tightly, and then you have inactive chromatin and um, down regulation of expression. So these is, this is uh, sort of just a figure showing how uh, histone modifications and also similarly DNA methylation uh, affect gene expression regulation uh, through DNA accessibility. Now the focus of today is more on DNA methylation. Uh, here I have sort of a zoomed in version. You have a, a, you know, a, a um, double-stranded DNA here. There's cytosines here in green. And then there's this M for the methyl group that's added. So here's a close-up of the methyl group that's added to uh, the cytosine uh, nucleotide base. And in human, there are over 28 million of these cytosines followed by a guanine, so it's CPGs. So it's, that's the canonical site of methylation is a C followed by a G. And the P stands for the phosphate bond that you would see here in the single strand or uh, the backbone of the nucleotide sequence. There are other more rare occurrences of non-CPG methylation where you may have a C followed by an A, T, or C. Uh, 
This is maybe more, less common in mammalian genomes, uh, maybe more common in plants. So I won't touch on it a lot today, but just so that you're aware, there's always exceptions. Even though the canonical site is a CPG, um, there are always exceptions. So now I wanted to talk a little about uh, some of the structure in the genome related to CPG sites. Uh, and this is a topic that I'll come back to uh, multiple times later. So uh, this is, I would say, take home message number one is learning about CPG islands if you're not already familiar with them. Uh, as I mentioned, there's these Cs followed by Gs um, that are linked by a phosphate bond, the CPGs in the genome. And a very large percentage of them can be methylated. And here, if, here's a sort of strand here, uh, a, a genome here, um, and you see there are individual CPGs by bars. Can you see if I can get my, my, uh, my uh, mouse here? So you have individual CPGs, but then there are high, high density clusters of CPGs that are defined by the uh, window size, so at least 200 bases, a certain amount of GC content, and a ratio of CPG dinucleotides. So you can see very dense um, occurrences of CPGs. So many of these CPG islands occur in promoters, uh, at least half of uh, genes may have these in their promoters. And genes are usually expressed in CPG sites um, if the CPG island in their promoter is unmethylated. So it's actually a reverse relationship. So you can see here the gene body. <clears throat> so here's a gene architecture where you have exons in the transcription start site and the CPG island is here in the promoter. So when they're unmethylated, that actually promotes uh, the expression of the gene. So there's a nautical theme to, to this field. Uh, they're not only CPG islands, they're uh, there's also other set of elements that are of interest um, near the CPG island. So here's another figure just showing the gene arc body and where CPGs are here in these um, circles. I mentioned CPG islands that may be near you know, the promoter or you know, the five pine end of the gene. Uh, but then there's also shores, which are the regions near the CPG island and then shelves that are even further away. So it's of interest to not to study the CPG islands, but also the neighboring regions, both they refer to them as north and south uh, shore or shelf. Uh, so I'll get back to this later in the technologies, we're often trying to uh, particularly profile CPG islands in these uh, shelves and shore regions. So I, I mentioned this a little before, when CPG islands are uh, non-methylated you know, genes that genes tend to be expressed. So there's this negative relationship. So this methyl group, the CPG, tends to interfere with the binding of transitional activators. Okay, so uh, here, this negative relationship, you can see there's more DNA methylation, then you have more inactive uh, chromatin, uh, less active expression, where if DNA methylation is low, then you have more active gene expression. So this, the, again, the expected relationship is, is this inverse. Um, not always true in the data. Many data sets I've worked with not necessarily see that, but because there's lots of noise or other factors that also contribute to changes in gene expression. But that's the expected right negative relationship. So I would say this is another take home point is that we, um, it's an inverse um, relationship between methylation and gene expression. So DNA methylation, uh, I mentioned this a little earlier, but uh, what's interesting is it really finds this interest, a balance. Um, it, it is similar to genetics in that um, it is heritable through cell division. So uh, some of the early animal models, you could see uh, methylation marks inherited through uh, the next the first generation, but also second generation. Uh, so there's a stable part to it, but it is also very plastic and dynamic. Uh, it can change due to the environment. Uh, they now have been studied in a variety of different exposures, whether it be diet or smoking or even exercise. Uh, early life exposures in, in utero and so on. Uh, so there's this balance of this both the stable and that plastic part, which I think makes it really interesting to study. Um, and you can think of it in a, a life course, it can also kind of provide this record of exposures that one has had over their life. Um, so I, I like this figure here, this Venn diagram, because it shows endogenous factors like aging. So there are aging uh, effects and that uh, methylation changes with aging. That's this more endogenous individual and also so individuals may have different sort of uh, rates of methylation, this increased seeds of methylation. But then you have the other exogenous factors I mentioned, all those environmental exposures or smoking or diet, uh, bacterial infections, 
Um, and so here in the middle, they have maybe some that maybe are affected by individual responses, um, but also affected by uh, external stimuli. So, uh, so I think it's very interesting, both the endogenous and the exogenous and both the inherited part, but also the dynamic changing part to DNA methylation. So I mentioned some early work with animals, but another uh, sort of early work was also with twin studies. Uh, very interesting because here you have, you, know, uh, you, you can look at monozygotic twin, zygotic twins where they have the same genetic material. Uh, but even uh, you can see that even in those cases, within a twin pair, you see a lot of different epigenetic differences, which is here in the x-axis and just the, the, the level of significance or the strength uh, are in the y-axis. But they just, just to show that, that how it, they're again inherited, but also changing. And even in monozygotic twins, you'll see differences in, in these methylation and epigenetic marks. So again, also very interesting uh, for these reasons. So over the years now, probably the DNA methylation has, the last 10, 15 years have been studied a lot of sort of explosion of, of, of projects and research and cohorts to look at DNA methylation, a lot of animal work. Um, and they have a very wide spectrum of studies. Uh, for example, study biological processes, for example, you know, stem cell differentiation or embryonic development, or just like I said, the aging process or just inflammation. Uh, also a lot of work in disease mechanisms, uh, cancer and asthma, diabetes. Um, and then, in, um, as I mentioned, environmental exposures. Uh, for example, I've been involved in studies looking at uh, exposures in utero, whether they're chemical or um, traits of the mother, obesity, and then what, uh, looking at methylation changes in the offspring and then how those methylation changes may be uh, mediating uh, later uh, risk for um, obesity or adiposity and, and, and diabetes. So, so that's, you can also link the environmental exposures with the disease mechanism. So uh, even though I have these as separate bullets, um, there's interesting questions that can span uh, all of these areas. So, uh, so a lot of work in this and a lot of in, in um, also in neuropsychiatric diseases and substance abuse. Um, so, so now, how do we, now that I've kind of shown you the big picture of why uh, sort of the Basics about DNA methylation, the basics in the biology. Uh, I want to show an illustrative example of one of these studies and then get into how do we actually do the profiling. So, this example um, is from some collaborators in Oregon Health Sciences um, who study uh, non human primates and, and look at uh, alcohol use disorders. So, they, had, um, they were looking at DNA methylation and alcohol dose dependent, um, so high drinking, low drinking animals, and found that methylation expression in a certain brain region identified coordinate regulation of synaptic genes. So, uh, so they wanted to study the neuroadaptive changes associated with dependent or compulsive drinking. Uh, they had this non-human primate model, and they were looking at particular brain region, the nucleus accumbens, um, uh, that here I have quoting the paper, it's a relay station um, that can integrate environmental stimuli uh, to drive behavioral output, um, such as alcohol seeking. So they wanted to know the biological mechanism that could cause these changes to, you know, due to long-term alcohol use. So they had a uh, rhesus macaque, uh, uh, the monkeys, uh, so they uh, basically laid out adolescents to adults. And over a 12 month period, they were Projected to voluntary and long term uh, ethanol self administration. Okay. And they had open access to alcohol and water, and then their intake was recorded. So then the subjects, so a subset of the original subjects, were grouped into either the low or binge drinking animals versus a very a high or very high drinking animals. And then they were interested in profiling, genome wide profiling of the methylone, uh, particularly this nucleus accumbens uh, core region. Uh, I mentioned here the, the type of platform they used. I'll get into more details later, but it was based on sequencing. Um, and then they followed up some of their top hits. They looked at the genes nearby and with some uh, targeted gene expression. So I can't get into the full uh, details of the study. I just wanted to show a couple slides to illustrate what other kind of result you would get from this kind of analysis. 
<clears throat> so they found uh, 17 differentially methylated regions. So these are regions that have multiple CPG sites, maybe in a few hundred bases, uh, that changed in the high versus the low drinking mice. And those are the red and blue bars here. Um, these, each of these is a, a DMR, and this is the gene that's nearby. So they were also so these regions, their methylation levels were correlated with the average daily consumption, alcohol consumption level. Uh, then they, they looked at the genes nearby, and eight of them, uh, you can see this figure mapped, um, were implicated in modulating synaptic plasticity. Some of the genes here, like CD, let's see. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I hear uh, my coins, CDH5 right here. You can see here at the, this interface with the synapse. Then they did a validation. Uh, you can do, uh, this is a genome-wide study, but you can also validate uh, single sites uh, using uh, amplicon-based uh, sequence, phosphate sequencing to validate some of these significant findings, and then followed up with gene expression. And so some of the genes also showed that expected relationship. Uh, here's the, one of the down, you know, downstream genes from that differentially methylated region. And you can see how expression is correlated with ethanol, average ethanol intake, but also that expression is negatively associated with methylation. So here's one of these nice expected relationships. Um, uh, so, so they use not only the methylation, but then followed up with gene expression in a targeted way um, to support their findings. So, um, so as you can see, uh, this uh, had both a sort of targeted and a, and a whole genome approach, and they use sequencing. So now I want to get into what are the, how did they generate the data? Okay, so I want to get into some of the, the technologies. So I'll first say a few words about kind of big picture, um, the considerations that need to be made for methylome profiling and a little about the history. So uh, <clears throat> experimental methods, uh, even at a single site, single CPG site, um, it turns out that DNA methylation information is erased by standard molecular biology techniques. So you can't just do sort of cloning and PCR implication like you would for gene expression, okay? Because it erases those marks. So there's a pretreatment that's needed, okay? So this would be a take home message too that you need to do some kind of pretreatment. Uh, and there's, there were three that have been used now. Um, the last one is the one that's mainly used, but I wanted to kind of talk about the other two just so to uh, put this in context. Uh, there, some of the pretreatment used restriction enzymes, others used affinity. Uh, enrichment, and now the most common is using bisulfite conversion. So the first one, restriction enzymes. There are some, uh, actually several restriction enzymes that are sen uh, methylation sensitive, so they don't erase the methylation marks, and they cleave at unmethylated target sequences, so that's the red line here, where the methylation sites are here in green, and they, they leave the methylated DNA intact. Um, so now we've got these fragments, um, these cleaved regions, and then you can follow them by either array or sequencing. And some of the early whole genome methylation arrays were actually uh, this charm array. I remember when I first started in this area, um, working with that. Uh, there, there are some disadvantages, relatively low coverage. And um, some of the, some, if you, within these cleave sites, you may have some um, limited CPGs contained in those regions that are, are, are cleaved. So this fell out of favor. Um, other approaches, uh, but, but maybe used in certain contexts, of course, if they're suitable. Uh, another pretreatment is called affinity or enrichment, where there are antibodies that are, um, or methyl binding proteins that can pull down methylated regions. And they have these initials, if I'm uh, listening to them here in case you ever see them, methyl DNA immunoprecipitation, MEDIP, or methyl CPG binding domain protein, MBD. So you can pull down these methylated regions. And then once you have the regions, you can follow by array or sequencing, just like before. Uh, they don't require a lot of starting material, and they are biased towards higher density CPGs. So you're going to get more of the CPG islands. You may not get like sole or uh, lonely kind of CPGs that are on by themselves. Um, now it doesn't provide, at least the earlier versions, did not provide single base resolution because you would, um, uh, at least with the arrays, you pull down these. You do more of a regional analysis. So the pretreatment that now is mainly used is biocyclic conversion. Uh, which I think is very cl clever uh, how this works. Um, the idea is you can you treat denatured gen genomic DNA with sodium bisulfite. And what that does is it deaminates unmethylated cytosine. So here, let's say we have two uh, fragments of DNA. The M here in, in the red 
uh, denotes a methylated CPG, while the blue is an unmethylated. If you have this pretreatment with the bisulfate conversion, what happens is the methylated CPG stays uh, as a C, but the unmethylated converts from the C to the U, and then you have a PCR application, then you get a T. So that's the this, um, conversion part. So you basically, what, you, what used to be a C is now a T. So what you can do now is examine how many times, you know, where and how many times you see the C stay the same, but the C change to T. And you can quantify that again using a razor sequencing. Okay? And what it looks like now is an epigenetic difference looks like a genetic difference. It looks like it's a single nucleotide variant. Okay? And we've had technologies to measure uh, you know, uh, genomic variants for a long time. So now you can kind of use those strategies or at least that, that approach um, to look to examine where these changes occurred. Okay? So I would say this is another take home message. I'm gonna come back to this many times. So remember this bus sci fi conversion step, uh, it, it, it comes, it's very important because it'll affect how we do all the data processing and analysis later when we get into the bioinformatics. So this table uh, is kind of a, it's an older table, but I, I do like how it summarizes uh, a lot of the choices. You know, you can do the pre different pretreatments. You can do low throughput versus genomide, and low throughput is still useful. Like I just mentioned, that paper did a validation using a low throughput approach, where they just validated a few sites. Uh, for example, some of my studies, we've we've used chiral sequencing as a way to validate our top candidates. So genome wide. You see here, there's array-based versus next-gen next-generation sequencing. There's a sequencing-based analysis. Uh, arrays here uh, now, uh, the Infinium is probably the one that's most widely used, and this is one of the few omics areas, genomics areas, where arrays are still used. They are still practical for large human studies, where other kinds of omics are now like, arrays have been replaced by RNA sequencing or chip sequencing. Um, so arrays are still very commonly used. All the studies I've done in these large human cohorts where we have hundreds of samples, uh, we still use arrays. Um, so it's most practical for large human studies, but what is uh, more comprehensive is sequencing when you have smaller human studies or animal models where you have less samples. Um, so sequencing is sort of more, the most comprehensive. So that's still the clear advantage. But again, when you're trying to balance cost and, you know, coverage, sometimes you have to make those decisions and, and go with arrays. So I'll talk about arrays and sequencing both. But both of them provide an uh, genome-wide analysis. So that's referred to as epigenome-wide association study. So it's like genome-wide association study, GWAS. The idea is you want a comprehensive look in the genome, look at, identify methylated regions in a sample, percentage methylation, uh, even differences between samples. Uh, and again, you can use these array or sequencing technologies and you can get similar figures like you would in a GWAS. If you're familiar with these figures, they're called Manhattan plots where you have chromosome and the x-axis and then some association with uh, either the exposure or a disease or a uh, dreaming group and the significance on the y-axis. <clears throat> and then you have some genome-wide cutoff, these horizontal lines for your top candidates. So we can perform these EWAS studies using now a razor sequencing. <clears throat> Before I get into the two technologies, I did want to say there are some issues, though, when you think about what samples to collect. Um, in some cases, you have a single um, cell type, but in many cases, you have to deal with cell mixtures. Uh, again, working with blood, um, we work a lot with blood, core blood, um, placenta. Uh, those are all cell mixtures. Um, so what, what's interesting is that different cell types may have different methylation levels and also different groupings of your samples, whether it's a disease or a exposure, may have different cell types as well. So what you may be seeing, sort of confounding, is if you're seeing different methylation levels, are you seeing, um, does that reflect the disease or outcome or exposure, or whatever that is that you're looking at, or is it also reflecting the, the cell mixture? Um, and those are not, those are both interesting questions. And, Here's a graphic showing this. How, how can we tease this out? Let's say you have two cell types, your red and blue, uh, cell A and cell B, and you can see case in the controls, you have different ratios. Here it's four to five, blue to red, but here it's two to seven. So that's what you may be observing. So there are different ways to deal with this. 
Um, if you have whole blood samples, you may have actually blood cell counts, if possible. Many studies, many studies don't have that. There you actually have the, can have the absolute percent of, of major cell types and you can use those as fixed effects in your model. So you have that for every subject or sample. Other times you can use reference data for some of the most common tissue types like whole blood, but that's not true for um, more unique tissue types or not as well studied. Um, and those references have been developed. So they, they identified the methylation marks that differentiate the different cells in that uh, cell mixture. And then you can use that to estimate your um, cell mixture in your samples. And then there's reference-free approaches when you don't have uh, reference data. And they, tend, they rely on matrix decompositions and these sort of high-dimensional data approaches. Um, I list some of these here. Um, these are a little more, uh, let's say, more risky in that um, you don't have the reference. So they're, es they're estimates and you may be introducing noise uh, with any estimate. So you may be introducing noise into your later analyses. So we always have to proceed with caution with reference-free approaches. Uh, and what we do in our work is we actually, we actually uh, do both. We, do, um, we don't use reference-free, but usually we use reference data and we perform analyses with or without the cell type um, correction um, because differences in cell types actually could be interesting for your system that you're studying. So uh, reviewers will always complain if you don't do it in grant reviewers and paper reviewers. So it's good to prepare for this. Uh, somebody will say something. Um, so just, that's why I wanted to bring this up early on. So that's probably another take home message is uh, if you're dealing with cell mixtures, think about um, uh, a comp cell type composition with how you want to uh, deal with that in your analysis. Okay, so I think we've set things up now. So we, we have our samples. How do we do this methylone profiling? Um, and so we, and how do we, what technologies do we use? Okay, so I'm gonna go through arrays and then sequencing. So arrays, as I mentioned, are still the go-to for large human studies. So I wanted to tell you, um, kind of give you the background on that. The most popular, so sort of majority of, of uh, platform used is the Illumina. It's called the Infinium assay. And it came out more than you know, 13 years ago. And you can see the evolution. It started out with about 28,000 uh, individual CPG sites covering about 50,000 genes. So about one or two CPG sites per gene. Then they got to a bigger sort of platform where you can cover, uh, they call it the 450K. There's also, it's actually 485,000 sites, but there's a lot of control probes and, um, covers almost all genes and you have uh, about 17 CPGs per gene. So much more coverage per gene, covering almost all the CPG islands, many of the shores and shelves. But even though this was a big advance, it only covers about, again, if you're looking at the human genome, uh, but, uh, about uh, one and a half percent of CPGs in the genome. Uh, then you get to the Epic Array, the latest version, which is almost twice as much. Um, but th what they focused on is not just genes and CPG islands, but more of this open C. Again, we've got the nautical sort of C theme. Uh, these are CPGs that are away from genes, are enhanced regions, which are sort of the binding sites, open chromatin. So they're kind of in these, again, not, not as close to genes anymore. So they tried to, to, to get more of the genome, but it wasn't so gene-centric. So uh, just one slide to show you how these probes work. Um, the idea is, let's say we, this green uh, line here is a DNA fragment from your sample. And here on this column is the unmethylated version of it. It's, un it's unmethylated, a particular CPG site. So what the array has is probes for either unmethylated or methylated. Uh, and, so, and this is also true for, um, for genetic for, uh, genotyping assays. Some flavor of this. The idea is if it's unmethylated, um, the C converted to a T, so reading from the, from the five prime end here, so the C converted to a T, so there's a probe that has an A in the complementary uh, part. So it hybridizes to the unmethylated B type. Um, where there's another bead, that's what the Illumina uh, assays are. You have these beads with these probes. Uh, there is the version that has, that's complementary to C, uh, CPG. So it's got the G, which is complementary to the C. And here there is no hybridization. So here you would see fluorescence the unmethylated uh, bead, but you wouldn't see in the methylated bead. Now, let's say you have another sample where you have uh, methylation at that locus. Now, it won't hybridize to the unmethylated probe 
So we'll hybridize to the methylated group. Um, so the point is to remember that this bisulfite tri tri treatment converted the Cs to Ts in the unmethylated positions. Um, since then, so that they could get more probes on their arrays for more real estate, they were able to uh, design single probes because you lose like half your real estate on methylated, unmethylated, the pairs. Um, they were able to instead, um, you add a different, if the probe goes only until the G, the complementary part of this G part of the CPG, and then whether nucleotide is added, it, you add a fluorescence if it's red, if it's uh, methylated, unmethylated, or green if it's uh, methylated. So you look at the color to tell you the methylation status. So, but both these cases, you basically get the ratio of the fluorescence that's emitted of the methylated part divided by the sum of the methylated and the unmethylated. So it's this ratio. So re remember this, it's called the a beta value, and we'll come back to this many times because it's relevant for sequencing as well. So with data processing with arrays, you have, you know, there's image analyses where you get the, uh, the so the Illuminous platform software, you get average methylated, unmethylated in the ratio. There's some background correction, because some, some low, sort of low level fluorescence that may occur in the background. Or, and you can, there's a lot of negative probes that can be used for this, or even deconvolution methods to try to separate the uh, real signal from the background. Uh, then there's some filtering of probes. Uh, if there's high intensity probes, they may be uh, saturated. So sometimes those are removed. And then there's other probes that may be removed. Um, when you, because you have these negative controls on the arrays, you want your true probe to have an average signal that's much higher than the negative control. The negative control should be really low level or background. So basically you can calculate kind of a normal distribution based on all the negative controls and get a Z score for how for a true probe, um, a true probe that is profiling methylation um, is different from that background distribution. And you can get like a Z score and then convert that to a P value. So you want ones that have very small p-value, but they're very different than the negative controls. So there's this detection p-value. Um, you remove ones that are high because those are the ones that kind of that look kind of like the negative controls. Then I remember I mentioned this bisulfite conversion. It makes it look like thing. Um, it's a genetic change, a genetic variant. Um, but what if you actually have a probe in a the genomic region where there is a SNP? Um, what, what something that may look like it's a methylation change is actually a genetic variant. So this is going to come up with sequencing later. Uh, and actually, this occurs pretty frequently in a lot of the probes. And it could be anywhere in the probe. The probes are a few dozen bases, but it could also be exactly at the CPG site. If it's in, generally in the probe, it may affect hybridization. Um, but the thing is, you're studying maybe different populations or, or um, subgroups. Uh, in some cases, these SNPs are rare and they have low alternative allele frequency, but other times they may have higher frequency. So uh, you may get this confounding, and that's what this next slide shows, is if you don't have any variants, what you're measuring, it looks like this is what it says, methylated versus unmethylated, and maybe you have 90% methylated versus 10% unmethylated. If you happen to have a, a genetic variant, uh, it may look like it's um, methylated or unmethylated, and you may have a variant where you actually have a range of methylation and unmethylation at that position and also the variant. So the signal gets mixed between the unmethylated and um, the genetic variant. So you have this uh, confounding and you don't know your signal, is it due to which of these factors? So often we flag probes uh, that, we, you know, if you happen to have a population, you have the genetics, you, you know, even uh, the population that you're looking at, uh, you know, the real frequency, you may uh, flag these um, or, or remove them. Um, okay, and then let's see. Uh, oh, other kinds of probes. Again, this is an issue with sequencing, so I wanted to bring it up here. Uh, this bus sci fi treatment, remember, you're converting a lot of the Ts, the unmethylated CPGs to, uh, sorry, the Cs to Ts. So basically, you're reducing the complexity of your genome. Um, you have a basically four-letter genome. I want to say it becomes entirely a three-letter genome, but it's reduced a lot of it to looking like a three-letter genome. So that means you may have uh, fragments of DNA that's hybridized to probes because they've you've lost the specificity. So they may be hybridizing in different locations. 
Um, so often we, we, those have been identified in the past and you can remove those, but that's another thing to keep in mind is removing those probes due to this to the consequence of the bisulfite treatment. So after you've done all that, uh, let's say you get this data value that I mentioned. Uh, here's a little more complicated formula, but it's the same idea. Methylated divided by the sum of the methylated and the unmethylated. Uh, it's a max because you may have some negative values due to the background correction. Uh, and so you avoid those negative values and you may divide it by, there's a little alpha there to avoid dividing by zero. Now the beta you can see here, it's often in these cell mixture type of studies, you get this um, bimodal distribution. So this, what I'm seeing is that uh, most of the um, sample is unmethylated, not methylated. So that's zero is unmethylated. And you often have two peak, one or the other peak, you don't have much in the middle, um, but there's exceptions, of course. Uh, the thing is this type of beta value is not, um, when it's bounded by zero and one, there's a lot of statistical methods later that you can't really use this bounded data. So you'd have to use more complex modeling and sometimes that becomes inefficient time-wise. We're trying to do this hundreds of thousands of times. So often the analysis is done on the M value. So that's just a transformation of the beta value. So you get the continuous range. So you can get positive and negative values. The bimodal nature doesn't go away because that's, just, that's the true nature. You don't want that to go away, um, but the M value can be used um, in more statistical approaches. What we do is we often analyze at the M value, but we report on the beta value because the beta value is more intuitive. You get this percentage. Um, so we, we, do get, we do get both. Um, so to, to be able to interpret that. Uh, I think this is my last slide. Uh, now, in terms of data processing, uh, there's some, like uh, many arrays, you have to do some normalization. Uh, there's within array normalization, I mentioned these type one and type two probes uh, that sort of evolved as Illumina changed their platforms. And it, but it turns out the, the type two are actually, their signal is not as good. And if you line them up, uh, here's the red and the blue, they don't line up as well. So you need to do some uh, normalization so they line up better. So that's what you have here on the right. Um, the red now has a better range, a full range of methylation, lines up better between the type one and type two, and you have less variability. So it's important to do some within array normalization. And then there's also, now you have multiple samples, across samples. Um, a lot of the methods, I don't have to begin into them, they do take advantage of metagative control probes. So it's, it's a nice advantage of the arrays. Okay, um, sequencing. Uh, maybe I should start. There was one question here in the chat. Smallest size or lowest cell number? Oh, it's a good question. I think now people are going, right? there are methods to do single cell methylation profiling. So um, it, it's been attempted. Um, I, I, I have not had an opportunity to do, do analysis of that myself, but it could be as little as one. Um, I don't know what kind of coverage you have, but um, uh, so that's the lowest cell number. Um, the other question was about sample size. Usually you do, again, I'm, I, with human, there's a lot of variability. So you do in human, you need a, ideally at least a hundred and usually more than a hundred, several hundred, uh, if you're doing these EWAS studies because of all the multiple testing. Uh, in animal studies, um, you get a signal stronger, you have less variability, because you've got the controlled environment. Uh, you could see that paper that I just I showed you, they only had, I think, seven and nine uh, in the groups. You can get away with a lot less with animal models. So, um, so. Katrina, you can ignore that last question. That's okay. a good one for um, the, the after. Okay, good. Yeah, I have to think about that one. Okay, so sequencing. Um, so, now, addition, for sequencing, in addition to the pretreatment, you also need to do some kind of um, pull-down method. Be what is a pull-down method? It helps you, it, it's a way to uh, decide on how much of the genome you're gonna cover, okay? So ideally, you can do whole genome and capture all the CPGs, all 28 million, but this is incredibly expensive. Um, of course, everything is getting cheaper, but it's still expensive to do on many samples. So there's two alternatives maybe more now, uh, to uh, get a small, still get more coverage in arrays, but not as much as the whole genome. And there's something called reduced representation that targets CPGs and CPG regions. And then there's methyl capture that tries to do specific capture doing some, some commercial kits. 
So the whole genome sequencing, basically the higher genome is fragmented. You can get, you know, like I said, millions and millions of CPGs in theory, but you do need a lot of coverage. And they do recommend getting, you know, up to 30X. So this would take a lot of amount of sequencing to get that kind of coverage. Um, there was a review recently that estimated, well, even though on average you may have 30X, some, a lot of sites may not have a lot of coverage, maybe one to 10X. And the estimates there for methylation are not that reliable. And so they were estimating you may need up to 100X, which now gets even more expensive. So I don't know if this was very conservative or not, uh, probably, but it's just to show you that you do need to do a lot of sequencing to get good coverage for all those millions and millions of sites. So too, it's really too costly for many groups, but some big consortiums have used them, like in code and the roadmap. So the alternatives are these reduced re representation methods. Um, Basically, you pull subsets of DNA, so there is a restriction endonuclease that can cut DNA into fragments at CCGG sites. So what happens is, remember the CPG islands? Well, those are enriched in the CCGG sites. So this um, restrict this fragmenting is enriched in uh, islands and promoters and you know, shelves and shores, um, and it's not affected by methylation status. So it does capture a lot of the islands and promoter regions, but you know, there's not this motif, the CCGG is not necessarily uniform. So some genes may have more or less, so you don't get that uniformity, but it's more cost efficient. Then there's these uh, other pull down methods that are the commercial kits that, that you need less genomic material. There's a couple there and I may, this may be a little outdated now, there may be more, uh, but they get between, you know, 3.7 to five and a half million CPGs. So a lot more than the arrays, not quite as many as the whole genome. And the kids target genomic regions where they, they methylation mode to impact gene regulation. Okay. Um, so they've tried to focus on those regions. Um, so again, get more than arrays, but um, not as much as whole genome. So now that we've performed the sequencing, uh, have reads, others, you get all these reads, like millions and millions and billions of reads. In some cases, if you do whole genome sequencing, um, I know you probably have, I think there's been webinars in the past about RNA sequencing. So some of this is similar. There's some kind of uh, trimming of, of reads uh, in, they've been sequencing the adapter or they have low sequencing quality. There's other trimming that's specific to methylation. Um, you know, the for example, bisulfite conversion failure is known to be enriched at the five prime end. Um, and there's with this, um, the reduced representation, there's this end repair that happens and that can cause uh, artificially unmethylated um, CPGs. So there's some trimming um, so it takes into account more of the position um, of, of, of the methylation of the CPGs and so on. So here's an example of that figure here, kind of where you would trim, where you have low, lower quality, um, uh, the read, read quality. Then it's the mapping. So this is very important. So I'm, I'm going back to the bisulfide conversion. Remember, we've just converted the, uh, a lot of the genome from C's to T's because they're unmethylated. So if you try to map to the genome, which you could, like, like an RNA-seq study, you could just map to the genome, uh, you're gonna have problems um, because a lot of the reads are not gonna be complementary to this reference genome because they've been converted. So you need to be, be able to align both to the original C, um, if it hasn't been converted, and to a T, if it has been converted. So you need to account for these C to T conversions. So it's a very interesting uh, informatics and sort of algorithms to do this. Uh, to adjust for this. So one idea is, that some methods use is use a wildcard. Uh, at that position, substituting a C with the IUCAC symbol, which is a Y, which is for C or T. So you do the mapping allowing for a C or a T. Of course, um, you get more, map, more counts and more maps. So you have to think about that. Um, it may inflate methylation levels and so on, but that way you don't lose a lot of your reads. So that's one strategy. The other strategy, is uh, thinking of basically converting the reference genome and taking the reference genome and converting a lot of the C's to T's and doing this both on the forward and the reverse strand. Um, so, so now we can map uh, directly and you don't have this wildcard symbol. Uh, and there's a lot of algorithms that do that. Um, Problem is you may get more mapped multiple location mappings uh, because you did reduce the complexity of the genome. So uh, those may need to be removed more than you would in other type of sequencing experiments. So um, there's pros and cons, different methods, but it's an interesting informatics question 
um, because of this bisulfide conversion. And then finally, there's some QC and filtering. Uh, you may want to re remove reads based on you know, quality scores, multiple mappings, things you would do otherwise in any sequencing experiment. But there are some specifics to methylation, uh, maybe removing CPGs that didn't have a high coverage. If it's less than 10x, it's not really reliable. Or you actually look at the quality score specifically at the CPG site. Um, often in other types of sequencing, you would just like take the overall or wouldn't be so base specific. But here, we really want that quality of the score uh, to be good um, at the CPG site specifically. Uh, and in the end, this is what it looks like you have. You have the reference, you have some reads. Here I have an example of a site where two of the eight reads is methylated and the other six is not. So you would say this is 25% meth uh, methylation. And so it's the same beta value as before. So this is used for analysis, just like you would with um, the arrays. Okay, so the last part um, are is analysis and resources. Again, this is just an introduction. I just wanted to show the main types of analyses. One of the most common is looking for differentially methylated positions. And they're called DMPs and they're the single site position. And you can either work with the M value that's converted, and then you can do more of the classical statistical approaches, Gaussian models, t-test, even non-parametric, using some of these empirical Bayes approaches that we see in um, gene expression analysis, like Lima. Or you can work with the beta value, um, but you need to model that the data is between zero and one. So you can use uh, these beta regression models. And those also model that there's more variability at the extremes, close to zero and close to one. So it's important to model that. Using counts directly, you have to be a little careful because the counts, um, if it, they may not account for unequal coverage of samples, you know, there's over dispersion. So there are some beta binomial approaches that do that. I, I, um, but you need to be careful. I would not use the counts by, just by themselves. You need to think about the right type of model to account, to account for this kind of um, over dispersion. And finally, you're going to be doing this hundreds of thousands of times or millions. So you need to do multiple testing, and that goes back to the sample size issue. Um, and it depends on your what species you're looking at, the, sort of the strength of the signal. Um, but there are soft there are software to help you do power analysis to help that identify how much your sample size should be. Another analysis is differentially variable position. This could be sometimes you don't see huge methylation changes; they're more subtle. They're only maybe a percent here and there. Um, so, that, so this is an example of cancer where you have a pretty big change um, normal, which is cancer tissue. Um, and if you look at the deviation from the median or average here, um, they're pretty similar between normal and cancer tissue. But this plot on the right here, the average may be similar between normal and cancer. So you don't have a differentially methylated position, but you see in cancer, there's some set samples that are, have a lot of variability, very different from the mean. And that's what this graph here shows. And the deviation from the mean is very different from a lot of the samples in cancer tissue. So in this case, this would be called a differentially variable position. Even though the average, the average between the groups is similar, their variability is different. And there's uh, statistical tests to do that, to test for equal variance in those methods, um, specifically for this kind of analysis. Then, uh, there are differentially methylated regions. So this is very common. The, the rhesus macaque paper that I sh showed before was looking at differentially methylated regions. This is thinking about not single site at a time, but more multivariate, multiple probes or sites at a time. And the idea is if CPG sites are clustered together, they may be behaving similarly and methylated in the same way. And this also, from a statistical perspective, improves power um, because now you're not testing as many individual ones. And also, it's a little less sensitive to some of that noise I mentioned. It could be outliers or SNP, you know, bad probes or bad you know, read quality, uh, maybe a SNP. Um, but it's not ideal for some of the uh, CPGs that are isolated, like those open C1s or the kind of lo you know, loners by themselves. You can't really use this approach. So there's two ways. You can group the sites first and then get a cluster and test for that, or you can test all positions and then cluster inter uh, regions that have a lot of significance. So the grouping the sites first, you can group by predefined regions like CPG islands, um, UTRs, other gene-oriented features. Um, and often smoothing is used. That's what this graph shows here. Each uh, point is a CPG site. And the coverage, actually, these are sequencing experiments, tells you the amount of the coverage 
Um, so the thickness of the, of the points tells you there's more coverage at that site. And so you can smooth across the genome as well. And that gives you sometimes better, better accurate estimates too. The other approach, you test sites first, you test them individually, you do a DNP analysis, but then you group them together. Um, so there's a, uh, and the advantages here, there's a little more flexibility with modeling. Some of the other approaches don't, if you have more complicated study design, um, don't allow for another, sometimes more than two group comparisons. So our, our group has developed one of these called COMP-P that allows for that flexibility in modeling. And we can also model that methylation sites next to each other may also be highly correlated. So you wanna, they're not independent, which a lot of statistical models assume. So you need to model that correlation. And then there's different cutoffs, you know, how, what's the distance, what is your region size? So there's some decisions that need to be made um, to define a, a DMR. And then, there all are also uh, some more interesting, um, sort of, uh, sophisticated modeling. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, hidden Markov models are used a lot in analyzing genome sequences. For example, gene prediction, um, that kind of annotation use hidden Markov models, but they're also been adapted to look at methylation. So this is just a little advertisement. Um, I don't have time to get into the modeling, but they have, the hidden Markov models can be really powerful and they model the relationship across the genome. I think that's the other nice feature where a lot of the other analysis methods just kind of treat each CPG site the same, but this one you can model them. Same. So uh, just an overview, what are you gonna do with all this information? Um, what are the downstream analysis? How do you interpret your results? One thing to look at is, are you, are you seeing hyper or hypomethylation? This, you know, where the, meth, the DMRs in that example paper I showed you, where they, hyper or hypomethylated in the, bin, you know, the heavy drinkers. So you wanted to know the direction of the effect. You also wanna know where these are located with respect to the genome. I should do that with that example paper, the look of the, the genes nearby. And then you can also do typical uh, over enrichment or gene set analysis that you would with the other gene expression type of analysis. And here you can see here, um, here is a DMR in red and it's kind of actually pretty big and it's actually overlapping the gene. Here, and you can definitely see the differences in methylation levels uh, for the different samples that are color coded by group. So this is an example of a visualization. And then you can get into more sophisticated modeling and integrating with other omics. Uh, it was done in a targeted way, but that previous uh, the paper that I showed you had some gene expression. You can do that genome wide as well. Uh, I mentioned SNPs. Uh, there could be variants that are associated or correlated with methylation differences. So you can look at the genetic uh, maybe effects of methylation changes. And what uh, our group does is a lot is trying to link exposures with outcomes and trying to test whether methylation mediates this relationship. Is this the biological mechanism that's linking some kind of exposure or treatment um, to some outcome? Okay. So uh, there's another, you get into more sophisticated modeling to do this. And then there's a lot of extensions. Um, what if you don't have a reference genome? You have a model organism that doesn't have a reference genome. Well, there's been bioinformatic methods to try to deal with that. Um, you can also use your methylation, your reads to do SNP calling, because I mentioned there are there is information there about variants. I mentioned uh, reconstructing cell type methylation patterns, trying to understand the cell types composition, uh, trying to respond to the chat. There is single cell methylomics. Um, and I glossed over, I didn't really describe all this, but there's always exceptions to biology, right? There's, we've been talking about the standard methylation, but there's other kinds of methylation. There's hydroxyl methylation, and that may be relevant in certain studies and certain systems or diseases. So there are sequencing methods to also profile these alternative kinds of um, modifications. Just, um, uh, just have two more slides um, to wrap things up. Uh, there are a variety of resources. These are the big consortium um, and code you've probably heard of that have a ton of data, different you know, cell types and conditions. There's also the NIH road, uh, Epigenomics Roadmap Project that has a lot of uh, epigenetic both histone modifications and demethylation, different tissue types, um, developmental stages, cell types. So great resources, a lot of information there. Uh, then there's more DNA methylation specific resources, just some um, consort, you know, kind of compendiums of different EWAS studies, uh, some focused on other species um, and trying to integrate with other types of omics data. So there's a lot out there uh, trying to collect all this information so it can be used you know, in, in, you can 
do your analysis on your data, but maybe you can see, well, maybe this was maybe there's methylation changes also in this other system that's related. So that concludes uh, my talk. Uh, sorry, I went a little over. I go out the hour. Uh, I wanted to conclude. I found this there's this nature, um, just a short review, uh, and they called it was called Epigenome: The Symphony in Your Cells. And I really liked. They had a video, but I'm just showing you the picture of this small orchestra. Uh, with a DNA sort of methylation uh, you know, illustration in the back um, to illustrate the symphony in our cells. So uh, thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks very much, Katerina. Uh, sharing if that helps. Anybody, please. If, if not, um, <laughs> I'll wait a little bit, but I do have a whole mess of questions. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, so, so do I, I could ask you, why, okay. don't I, why don't I get us started? And this might be- I'll give our regular um, webinar members some, some chance to work up questions before. Uh, Katarina, you did mention uh, the uh, hydro hydroxymethylation, hydroxyzine. Uh, and a little bit of my reading, I uh, sort of realized that uh, people think that that particular methylation is positively correlated oh, okay. in expression. And this uh, made me think, is this a confounder, mm -hmm. particularly since brain, uh, brain has a lot of, well, a lot, it's still small by comparison, but certainly a lot more than other organs of the hydroxycytosine methylation. Have you, uh, a drag, is there, as you mentioned, I think there's a different, is there a different sequencing or preparation technique that identifies those sites? Yeah, I, so I'm not an expert on that. I haven't actually looked at it myself, but I believe there's a different, like a pretreatment um, I don't know if, if anybody else can chime in if they have experience. I don't know if the bisulfite conversion works. Um, I see Rob shaking his hand. So it must be a different treatment. Um, so it doesn't erase those marks, um, uh, but keeps the hydroxymethyl group. And, and it's interesting to hear that you said it's more of a, it could be more of a positive relationship. And, and I must admit that sometimes I've seen, I, I, I don't know how much of the other technology may be picking up some of the hydroxymethyl uh, methyl, that type, um, because sometimes we see positive correlations between what we think is the standard methylation and expression, and maybe it's confounded by some of the signal. Okay, but, yeah. um, I'll, I'll definitely look farther into this. Yeah. yeah. I see a question from Xu Sheng for you, Katrina. Yeah. Uh, Xu Sheng, if you want to just say it yourself, or Katrina can read it. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, my question is: Any comments on advantage and disadvantage of nanopore direct DNA sequencing compared to uh, whole genome bisulfur sequencing in terms of methylation uh, profiling? So, uh. yeah, very good question. I think it's probably the same advantages and disadvantages as, as if you were looking at uh, RNA, right? You're, um, with whole genome, and you're looking at usually you know, multiple cells, you're getting an average um, and it could be prone to error, you know, reads, individual reads. So you maybe have more error and, and noise compared to signal. Um, have, you, have you worked with that? Actually, I can ask the audience too. Yeah, we do get some methylation data okay. from nanopore data. Yeah. And because nanopore has a higher error rate. Yeah. Um, and when we, when we, uh, talk about the DMP yeah. and how can we distinguish those uh, new DMP or oh, this is the error rate? Yeah, so that's a disadvantage, I guess, because uh, with, with the other approach, you're at least averaging over multiple reads. And even if some of them are lower quality, you have, um, they're maybe more robust. Like yeah, it should be found for DMR, but I, I concern about the DMP. Yes, DMP, where well, you need really good single site resolution and coverage. Um, so I agree, DMRs are more robust. 
Right. Usually we like to go to DMR, so maybe that's probably the record. Maybe that's the um, Thank way you. to go. Yeah. You're asking good questions. You guys are asking all the cutting edge stuff. 